Over the weekend, one UM donor and the namesake of the University School of Journalism and New Media requested for his name to be removed from the building. Coming up, NewsRot reporter DeAndrea Turner tells us how Meek's controversial post and the events from last week led to his decision this weekend. Good evening and thank you for tuning in to News Watch Ole Miss. I'm Matthew Henley. And I'm Madison Scarpino. Over the weekend, one UM donor in the namesake of the university's School of Journalism and New Media requested for his name to be removed from the building. News Watch reporter DeAndrea Turner is in the studio with the latest developments. DeAndrea? That's right, guys. Saturday night, Ed Meek requested via Facebook that his name be removed from the school. This decision came after a controversial post was made by him on Facebook last week. UM donor Ed Meek made one request to the School of Journalism and New Media to remove his name from the school. On Saturday night, Meek took to Facebook to issue an apology, saying his post did not reflect well on himself, the school, or the university, and that his name being attached to the school is no longer in the best interest of the school. His statement comes after the journalism school's faculty statement asks Meek to request his name to be removed from the building within three days. Meek's request comes after he posted a controversial post on Facebook. He posted a picture of two African-American women while detailing there is a problem on the square. Many journalism students and others filled a room last week to discuss that controversial post. Chancellor Jeffrey Vitter commended Meek on his statement from wanting his name removed. And journalism faculty sent an email this morning saying that they accept Meek's request. Journalism professor Alyssa Steele says the university is making positive strides. I think that Dean Norton making a statement, a video statement, I think the school making a written statement, I think the black faculty in the journalism school and IMC making a statement, the diversity committee making statements, I think that was progress for University of Mississippi. And I think it's going to lead the way, hopefully, to other changes on campus. She says progress is being made. And I think that change is happening. I think that um, our university needs to do more. It's not just the journalism school. I think it's the subculture here that needs to make students feel safe. And I think that they're trying to move in the right direction. Journalism faculty is continuing to meet to develop a plan to move forward. Matthew, back to you. Thanks, DeAndrea. The Ole Miss football team took on Kent State this past Saturday, and after a slow start, head coach Matt Loop talked about the adjustments his team made going into the second half. Um, thought the we just couldn't get going. Something was just off a little bit. We were moving the ball, but we didn't finish in the red zone in the first half. But I, I did think that we finished. Well, in the second half, it looked more like it was supposed to look. Uh, guys started making some plays, and uh, but, but again, overall, um, pleased that we were able to go get a uh, get a big win and a, a bounce back win, and we're gonna get up off the mat. So pleased that we're three and one. Coming up in Sports Watch, Annie Mapp will have a complete recap of the game. The Ole Miss hockey team began regular season play this past weekend. Newswatch reporter Hallie Ames is in the newsroom to let us know how the Ice Rebs did. Hallie? Thanks, Madison. While the rain might have delayed the football game, there were no delays in Olive Branch where the Ole Miss hockey team took on Eastern Texas Baptist University. This Friday, Ole Miss opened up their season against the East Texas Baptist University Tigers in a high-scoring game that ended in an 8-2 favor of the Rebels. The Rebels started their season with a new coaching staff and sophomore Nate Sullivan, who is the first scoring player of the season, thinks the new approach is playing a strong role in the team's success. Well, I mean, getting the first one off our back was huge, especially since we had a brand new coaching system coming in. So, I mean, we had a great play down low by Cole. He, uh, Made a great pass out in front, and I was just there to finish it. So when when we got the first one, it's like the monkey off your back, and then they just all started flowing. Everyone started chipping in. So it was a big team goal for the first one. From backhanders to brawls, this weekend's matchup was filled with action. Friday night, sophomore Lawrence Gerson said that in order to be successful against the Tigers against Saturday, the Rebels needed to stay focused on their game. We just got to stop getting chippy with them, you know. I'm very guilty of it. I get in the get in the mess of it a lot, but uh, we just got to ignore them. You know, they're a big physical team, and um, we just got to play our game, keep our heads straight. While the veterans knew the playing style of their opponent, many of the new faces on the team had first collegiate game jitters. Freshman goalie Cameron Parent had 60 saves over the course of the weekend and says he was able to channel the nerves with the help of his teammates. 
Uh, I was really anxious going out there, but I settled in, and the boys made me feel really comfortable out there after they just kept the shots to the outside, and felt good. After playing an impressive two-game stretch, Parent was voted player of the game by his teammates and was given a white cowboy hat to wear as a trophy for his hard work. Well, Larry found it in his closet today, but it goes to the player of the game, and I guess I'm player of the game today, so first time wearing a cowboy hat. The Ole Miss Rebels defeated the Tigers 8-2 on Friday and then again 7-4 on Saturday. Their next game will be next weekend versus South Carolina in Columbus, Georgia. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Hallie. The start of sorority and fraternity recruitment marks one of the busiest times of the year on the Ole Miss campus. Newswatch reporter Thomas Gorris gives us a look at the beginning of Greek Recruitment Week. Thousands of Ole Miss students participated in the first day of sorority and fraternity recruitment that kicked off Sunday morning. Potential new members spent the day visiting the 13 fraternities and 11 different sororities on campus. Over 7,000 Ole Miss students are currently involved in Greek life. This year, over 2,000 new students are signed up for the recruitment process. For some, like Sigma Pi member Hugh Bowling, joining a fraternity meant a chance to carry on a family tradition. My father was in Greek life. My grandfather is in Greek life here at Ole Miss. And I feel obligated to do it, and it's the best decision I've ever made. Cole Holland is part of the Inner Fraternity Council Judicial Board and a member of Delta Psi. Holland says the most important part of the Greek recruitment process is picking an organization that students feel at home with. You really need to make that decision for yourself. You know, your parents might be trying to make that decision for you. Your friends might be trying to make that decision for you. But you'll know where you feel uh, at home. You'll know where you feel most wanted and most welcome. Ole Miss IFC recruitment continues this Friday and Saturday with rounds two and three. Bid day is this Sunday. I'm Thomas Gores, Newswatch, Ole Miss. Jury selection is expected to start today in the retrial of Quentin Tellis, the 29-year-old man accused of killing and burning Jessica Chambers in Panola County. Chambers was burned alive on a rural road in Cortland, Mississippi in December of 2014. Juror, jurors failed to reach a verdict in the first trial last October, resulting in a mistrial. And jurors from outside Panola County will be used this time due to the widespread publicity of the case. The Chambers mother is, is Chambers mother is hopeful that the new trial brings justice for her daughter. The intersection at South Lamar and Belk Boulevards will be closed this coming weekend. The Board of Aldermen reluctantly approved the two-day closure last week. The closure will take place September 29th and 30th for the placement of the final surface on the roundabouts at the intersection. Contractors decided that closing the entire intersection would create a safer environment for workers rather than only closing one lane. And traffic is expected to be lighter this coming weekend due to the Rebels playing away at LSU. Oxford Bar and venue owners will soon face new financial strains. The new downtown ordinance will require ID scanners as well as cameras on the inside and outside of all alcohol serving venues. Bar owners are unsure of just how much everything will cost, but expect the price to be around a few thousand. According to the Oxford Alarm, a single security camera can potentially cost up to $900. Venues on the square do plan to comply with the ordinance, regardless of the potential complications. Oxford-owned Roanoke has been named among the top 25 historic homes. Roanoke has home to Nobel Prize winning author William Faulkner. This was the only Mississippi property to make the house method list at number 14. The home is selected due to its resemblance of the Yuck Napatafa County. Phone numbers are still written on the walls and Faulkner's books still sit on the shelves. Roanoke is open Tuesday through Sunday to visit for a $5 admission. Coming up, we'll have some updates on Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh and the latest development that could further postpone his confirmation. And stay tuned to see which fashion company Michael Kors may be buying and how investors are reacting to the possible news. But first, Jessica Everett has your first look at current conditions. Hey guys, as you can see, the high humidity will continue throughout the week. The temperatures will steadily rise and the chance of rain is not going anywhere. Taking a look at our radar, you can see that there's currently not any activity in our area, but tune into Stormwatch to see what the chance of rain will do. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? 
Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on, man, let's put a ride home. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. It's like, hello, that's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day, I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. Hi, Krista. Take you, Jamie, to be my wife. When we found out that we were pregnant, we were just elated. We were just sitting there waiting for the pediatrician. She said she won't be taking you in as a client. We are a lesbian couple, but she's just a baby. She's the one you're denying the service to. The future of Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein appears to be up in the air. We're learning that a meeting between President Trump and Rosenstein is now on the books for Thursday. Rod Rosenstein, Deputy Attorney General and Overseer of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's investigation, met with Chief of Staff John Kelly at the White House on Monday amidst reports he expected to be fired. This comes in the wake of a New York Times report that Rosenstein secretly discussed recording President Donald Trump and invoking the 25th Amendment to remove him from office, a report that Rosenstein has denied. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said in a statement he and President Trump had an extended conversation to discuss the recent news stories. Trump responded to the reports from the United Nations General Assembly Monday. I'm meeting with Rod Rosenstein on Thursday when I get back from all of these meetings, and we'll be meeting at the White House, and we'll be determining... Uh, What's going on? In the meantime, what remains unclear is the fate of Rosenstein's job. This looks to me like a slow-moving Saturday night massacre. Uh, it seems like the only question is whether uh, these steps take place now or they take place after the midterms when the president believes he'll pay less of a political price for it. Trump appointed Rosenstein as deputy attorney general but has expressed extreme frustration with him for months, partly over his decision to hire Mueller last year. Trump has repeatedly branded the Mueller investigation a witch hunt. All of this unfolding alongside a contentious Supreme Court confirmation process for Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Republican allies of the president have urged Trump to hold off on a purge of Justice Department officials until Kavanaugh is safely in place on the high court. Rosenstein was considering resigning from his job this morning, but again will meet with President Trump on Thursday to discuss his fate. President Trump attends his second United Nations meeting this week, and world leaders expect another round of confrontation with the U.S. over Iran, global trade, and foreign policy. The White House says that the president is expected to push foreign leaders to take a stronger stance against the global drug trade and will implore the world to focus on the spread of nuclear and chemical weapons. He will meet with South Korean President Moon Jae-in, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, as well as leaders of Israel, Egypt, France, Japan, and the United Kingdom. The top Democrat of the Senate Judiciary Committee is calling for an immediate postponement of any further action on Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation. This after a new allegation of sexual misconduct against the Supreme Court nominee surfaced. Kavanaugh and the White House deny the claim made by the second woman, Deborah Ramirez. The ranking Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Dianne Feinstein, is calling for an immediate delay in Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation proceedings and an FBI investigation after the New Yorker published new allegations of sexual misconduct from a second accuser. The New Yorker reports that Deborah Ramirez, a classmate of Kavanaugh's at Yale, says she remembers Kavanaugh exposing himself to her at a drunken college dormitory party. 
Kavanaugh categorically denying the claim, writing in part, This alleged event from 35 years ago did not happen. This is a smear, plain and simple. The White House throwing their full support behind President Trump's nominee, saying, This 35-year-old uncorroborated claim is the latest in a coordinated smear campaign by the Democrats designed to tear down a good man. Ramirez told The New Yorker that at first she was unsure of Kavanaugh's role in the alleged incident, but after assessing memories and consulting with her attorney, she is confident in her recollection. A classmate who was not at the party told the magazine he is 100% sure that he was told at the time Kavanaugh was the student that exposed himself to Ramirez, but a number of other classmates denying any memory of the party, including a student Ramirez said egged Kavanaugh on. A spokesman for Chairman Chuck Grassley tells CNN he plans to look into the accusation, but has no plans to postpone Thursday's hearing with Professor Christine Blasa Ford who says Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her at a high school party, a claim Kavanaugh denies. Judge Kavanaugh plans to use calendars from 1982 as part of his testimony, and Grassley is seeking any written, audiovisual, or electronic materials related to the allegations from both parties. Christine Blasa Ford is set to testify on Thursday. The police officer charged with manslaughter in the shooting of a man inside his Dallas apartment has been fired from her police department. Amber Geiger was fired during a hearing today. The 30-year-old Geiger shot and killed Botham Shem Jean after she thought she was entering her own apartment. The family attorney of the victim says that Jean's family was relieved by the news of Geiger's termination, but would still like to see Geiger indicted on a murder charge. Comedian Bill Cosby's sentencing hearing started today, and no sentencing determination has been made yet, and court will resume tomorrow. Lawyers spent part of the morning arguing over whether it's constitutional to label Cosby as a sexually violent predator and make him register as a sex offender. Cosby was found guilty in April of three accounts of aggravated indecent assault for drugging and sexually assaulting Andrea Constant in 2004. 81-year-old Cosby faces up to 10 years in prison on each count. The defense did not call any witnesses, but Cosby could take the stand tomorrow. Michael Kors may be on the verge of snapping up Italian fashion house Versace. The proposed deal gives Versace a roughly $2 billion valuation, according to Bloomberg. The U.S. handbag company bought luxury shoe brand Jimmy Choo last year and has been looking to continue its bolstering its group of luxury retailers against rivals like Louis Vuitton owner LVMH and Tapestry, the parent company of Coach and Kate Spade. However, investors don't appear to be too thrilled with the idea of buying Versace as Michael Kors shares drop 7% today. Kors and Versace have not responded to the possible purchase yet, but an announcement about the deal could come this week. Well, it was a rainy weekend in Oxford, but the sun has finally started to shine today, so maybe the clear weather will continue for the rest of the week. I definitely hope so. Jessica Everett will let us know if clear skies and cooler weather are in our future and her extended forecast up next on Stormwatch. Listen, you're my friend. I noticed you haven't really been yourself recently. Yeah, I feel like something's up. How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? I just want to know how you're feeling. And listen, even if you don't know what to say, I'm here to talk. No matter what you're going through, I just want you to know I'm here. I've got your back. When you want to talk, I'm here. in that this one no were you texting and driving again yes hi leah hi dad sorry about your bumper <laughs> <laughs>
Bible fans, well today was a very hot and rainy day, but currently we are sitting at a comfortable 79 degrees. It is mostly cloudy in our area, but there is still that low chance of rain. Taking a look at our for current forecast, you can see that active rain activity is definitely in our area and will continue throughout the week. Now taking a look at our current all around temperatures, you can see that South Haven, Holly Springs are at 80, Corinth at 78, Oxford at 79, and Tupelo at 81. Taking a look at tomorrow's temperatures, you can see that we will rise just a little bit, such as South Haven at 84, along with Corinth and Tupelo, Holly Springs at 83, and Oxford at the coolest at 82. Taking a look at tonight's forecast, we will chill down all the way to 70. But make sure to keep those umbrellas handy because we will still have some thunderstorms. Taking a look at tomorrow's forecast, we will warm up to 82. But like I said, make sure to keep that umbrella and those cute rain boots handy. Taking a look at our five-day extended forecast, you can see that the temperatures are still moderate all throughout the week. Wednesday at 75, Thursday at 77 with the weekend warming up all the way on Sunday at 84, but the rain chances will still be very high throughout the week. Thanks, Jessica. The Ole Miss soccer team pulled off an upset over number nine Auburn last night to find out how CeCe Kaiser made history with her game-winning goal. And the Rebel golf team finished the first round of play in Alabama. See where they stand next, up next on Sports Watch. Don't ignore the subtext. It's on us to intervene in sexual assault. Because we can. Take the pledge at itsonus.org. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread and kissed them all soundly and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. You think getting dumped by text is harsh? Try getting dumped by tennis ball. My ex owner drove me out to the woods, yelled fetch, and by the time I bought the ball back, he was gone. Yeah, I was pissed. <laughs> but the folks at the shelter helped me let go of my anger. I learned coping skills, like taking it to the hole. Boom! Now I'm ready to fetch again. But how about I throw and you run and get it? Welcome to Sports Watch. I'm Annie Mapp. The Ole Miss football team is back on their groove after beating Kent State 38 to 17 on Saturday. It was a wet day full of lightning delays, but the Rebels still came out on top after having a slow first half. During the second half, DK Metcalf helped change that narrative when he caught Jordan Taamu's 41-yard touchdown pass, putting the Rebels ahead by two touchdowns in the third quarter. The offense definitely came through, but now the Rebels will have a bigger challenge this week when they head to Death Valley to face number five LSU. And speaking of challenges, Ole Miss soccer CC Kaiser is showing there is no challenge she cannot take. Kaiser broke two records in a 3-2 win against Auburn yesterday. Entering the game, she was only one goal away from tying the all-time scoring goal record at Ole Miss, and she got it right at the 46th minute, giving the team a 2-1 lead. But Kaiser did not stop there. She also came in clutch in the 78th minute.
to break the all-time record for points scored and to give Ole Miss the victory. The next game will be at home on Friday against Texas A&M at 7 p.m. And the Ole Miss men's golf team is in Alabama today and tomorrow for the Shaw Creek Invitational. The event started this morning and consisted of 14 teams, including a first look at SEC opponents Texas A&M and Vanderbilt. Head coach Chris Malloy took seven players to the event with Braden Thornberry being in the first position. The first round of the Invitational is now over and the Rebels are currently led by freshman Jackson Suber, who shot a 70, putting him two under on the day. Altogether, the team ranks at six, with Texas A&M being in the lead. In the championship Sunday, red shirt Black Sacks fist pumping Tiger Woods is finally back on the biggest stage. Woods won his 80th tournament PGA win yesterday at the Tour Championship. After years, after years of facing the aftermath of surgeries, people were unsure if he could make a return, but boy did he prove them wrong. Despite shooting one over in the final round, his 11 under for the whole tournament was a good enough score to capture his first PGA win in five years. After dropping as low as 1,199 last year, Woods is expected to go to number 13 in the world. He is now a favorite to win next year's Masters. What a difference a year makes. That's all I have for you today in sports. Be sure to follow us at Newswatch underscore UM to stay up to date with all things sports. Matthew Madison, back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Annie. Up next, find out what rare animal has been found in Virginia. Stay tuned to see how this story will have you seen double and why you might not find it hysterical. We are Ole Miss Rebels. As Mississippi's flagship university, we dig deeper, see farther, work harder. We pioneered human organ transplants. We helped prove Einstein's theory of gravitational waves. We are distinguished as a Carnegie R1 top 2.5% research institution. We are Ole Miss, transforming lives and the world. They gave me Vicodin after my knee surgery. They kept prescribing it, so I kept taking it. I didn't know it would be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. <laughs> Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Remember that to love America is to love all Americans. Because love has no labels. This is something you don't see every day. This rare two-headed copper snake was found in a backyard in Woodbridge, Virginia. The Virginia Wildlife Management and Control posted videos and pictures of the snake on social media. The snake is currently being cared for by a private viper breeder, according to the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. National Geographic says the two-headed snakes are rare and typically develop the same way as Siamese twins. Two-headed snake. Don't you just want to go home and cuddle up next to that? You know, Matthew, oh, I most certainly do not. And I'm very happy that we don't see a lot of snakes here in Oxford. But one thing we have been seeing a lot of is rain. When's that going to change, Jessica? Yes, it will definitely continue all throughout the week. There's at least a 50% chance all week this week. So make sure to have um, your umbrellas. Thank you, Jessica. That's all we have for tonight. Thank you for tuning in News Watch Ole Miss. I'm Matthew Henry. Be sure to join us here again tomorrow night at 5 and on NewsWatchOldMiss.com. I'm Madison Scarpino. Thank you and good night.